Hi, welcome back to Mechanical P Exam Prep. This is Dan Malloy, Six Minute Solutions, problem number eight. A single stage refrigeration cycle operates with refrigerant 123. Assuming an isentropic process, no subcooling, 40 degrees of superheat, a condensing temperature of 260 degrees Fahrenheit, and an evaporating temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the coefficient of performance is most nearly what? Hint, the coefficient of performance of a refrigeration cycle is the net refrigeration effect divided by the compressor work. So I've drawn a picture of this refrigeration cycle on a pressure enthalpy diagram on the right, and I've done my best to record some of the givens and make sure that it meets the uh, details that they've listed here. So refrigerant 123, it's assuming isentropic, so I've drawn the, compress the compression part of the cycle as a line of constant entropy. That's why it's on this uh, slant. It's not straight up and down. Um, the expansion process is straight up and down for uh, constant enthalpy. It says no subcooling, so as you go through the condenser from 2 to 3, 3 is shown as being on the saturation curve, so it's a saturated liquid. It said 40 degrees of superheat, so for state 1, coming off of the evaporator, instead of showing that as a saturated vapor, I showed it as going further out to the right to accommodate that additional superheat before the compression. And then we also know the temperature of the condenser between states two and three, at least for the part that's in the middle of the saturation curve, we know the temperature is 260. So that would apply to state three and any part of this line that's in the middle until you get out here, because this will be superheated. And then we know the temperature of the evaporator is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that will apply for state four and any point along this horizontal line before we get to here. And then anything further to the right is superheated. And the question is, what's the coefficient of performance? So there's probably a formula that you can look up for that, but the way that I like to remember COP, and I literally remember this from my thermodynamics teacher in college, so it was pretty memorable at that point. Um, maybe it'll help some of you as well. And this is the most generalized definition of COP, the desired output over the required input. So if we're talking about a refrigeration cycle, What's the desired output? The desired output is to do some amount of refrigeration. The net refrigeration effect is Q in. It's the amount of heat that the evaporator picks up and removes from the space. So if it's the refrigerator in your house, it's how much heat it pulls out of the space inside the fridge. If it's a chiller, then it's how much heat it removes from the chilled water. It's the evaporator doing its work. So however much heat goes into the evaporator. And that's Q in. Q in is the refrigeration effect. That's the desired output of a refrigeration cycle. And then that's divided by the required input. What is the work that you have to do in order to cause that refrigeration cycle to happen? Well, you have to run the compressor. You also have to reject heat, and that's Q out. That's not energy that you have to put in. The condenser part is going to happen just by virtue of exchanging the refrigerant through some heat exchanger and, and putting heat into another medium. But the work that has to go in, that's the compressor work. That was a bit of a long-winded uh, explanation, but I think it's important to, to have an intuitive sense of what a COP is. And that's why the COP can be more than one. Obviously, you can remove a lot more heat from something than the energy it takes to run the compressor to do it. So in this case in particular, Q in would be M, de M dot delta H, right? So you have some mass flow rate of refrigerant around the cycle. And then what's the delta H for Q in? Well, it's the difference in enthalpy between state one and state four, the two sides of the evaporator. So H1 minus H4. And that's divided by the work, which is also M dot delta H, but it's a different delta H. Now it's the enthalpy at state two after the compression. So H2 minus before the compression, H1. So the name of the game is for us to use the information we have to work our way out around the cycle and find out what these enthalpies are and plug them in. Unfortunately, the mechanical engineering reference manual does not have a table for R123. So I looked one up online, which is fine because I'm at home on my computer, but when you're taking the PE exam, you may want to have uh, tables on certain refrigerants with you. And this is where the ASHRAE books really come in handy. I borrowed them from a friend for the test because they're a bit costly, but it might not be a bad idea. Now, in the case of 123, I don't know if they would ask you a question on it these days because 
hydrofluorocarbons are all being phased out and it may not even be applicable in the future but you know better safe than sorry and you know, having the ashray books would be a good idea just in case you need them so uh, and also i think it's worth mentioning this was in the six minute solutions this would be a hard problem to knock out in six minutes just because of having to go around the cycle even if you know exactly what to do so i'm going to start with state three at state three we know two things we know that it's a saturated liquid as i said no sub cooling and we know the temperature is 260 degrees fahrenheit and from those two facts we can go find out what the enthalpy is at state three and this is the document that i found thermodynamic properties for HCFC 123. So here we have the saturation properties and if we jump down to a temperature of 260 degrees right here then we can jump over to the enthalpy. This is H sub F, the enthalpy of a saturated liquid 72.6. So H3 equals 72.6. And I'm also going to jot down the pressure right now P3 198.6 and the reason I'm recording that is because I'm anticipating that when we get around to state two, it might be helpful to have the pressure so that we have another data point for state two. Okay, so why did we go after H3 when it's not one of the ones that's needed for the formula? After the expansion process, if we go from state three to state four, that's a constant enthalpy process. So we can say that H4 equals H3, and now we have one down. Oh, and by the way, the mass flow rate's gonna cancel, so we don't actually need to know the mass flow rate in order to find the COP. Okay, so now we just need to find H1 and H2, so let's continue around. Let's now take a look at state four. So at state four, we know the temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and we also know, because it wasn't subcooled, it's definitely a saturated mixture if we go horizontally down from the left side of the saturation curve. So based on those two facts, we can go back to the document again we can find out what the pressure is in the evaporator. So we're still in the saturated properties part of the table. So we know it's a saturated mixture and we know the temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're checking for the pressure and here it is, 20.8 PSIA. So P4, 20.8 PSIA. And because the entire evaporator is constant pressure, we can be confident that the pressure at state one is the same as the pressure at state four. P1 equals P4. Okay, so let's continue around to state one. So at state one, we now know the pressure, and I'm gonna round it off so that we can use this table. I'm gonna call it 21 PSIA. And we know the temperature because they told us there were 40 degrees of superheat. So the temperature in the evaporator was given to us as 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but then there's 40 degrees of superheat. So as we go from the right side of the saturation curve to state one, the temperature increases by 40 degrees, so it's 140. And again, if we know any two facts about a given point, that's enough to find out anything else we'd wanna know. So now we're in the superheated range, we're gonna use a different page in the chart, and I'm gonna find the section that has a pressure of 21 PSI A, that's right here, and the temperature is 140, that's right here, and we're interested in the enthalpy, so that's 108.4. H1 is 108.4, Let's also jot down the entropy from the same section that's right here, 0.2006, I'm just gonna call it 0.2. So now we know H1, so that gives us two more things, and now all we need is H2. So why are we recording the entropy? Well, it's about to go through a compression process that's known to be isentropic. So we can assume that the entropy at state two is the same as the entropy at state one, and now we have something useful. So for state two, we have S2, equals 0.2. And if you recall from the first round, we jotted down the pressure for the condenser, which is 198.6 PSIA. I'm just gonna call it 200. So P2 equals 200 PSIA. And we're still in the superheated range, so we can use the table yet again to find H2. So now we gotta go all the way down to where the pressure is 200 PSIA, and there it is. And the temperature we don't know, but we do know the entropy is 0.2. So that would be halfway between these, a little closer to the lower one. So let's call it 125 for the enthalpy. And that is the last piece of information we need. Now we can go ahead and find the COP by plugging this in. So let's jump to the bottom. H1 minus H4 over H2 minus H1. 
H1 was 108.4. I'm going to skip the units. They're all BTU per pound. Minus H4, which was 72.6 over 125 minus 108.4. And I'm getting about 2.15 on my calculator. And I believe there's an answer choice 2.1. So answer C is the best choice. So again, that one's a little longer than six minutes to work it all out. And of course, I'm you know taking my time, going slow, being careful to show all the steps. So if you're really comfortable working your way around a refrigeration cycle, you can probably do this much faster, and and you should try to increase your speed. But you know, as you can see, some problems might only take a minute or two, and others you not only need to have a special table that isn't in the merm, but you also need to have the skills and experience to work through things pretty quickly and the intuition to know the definition of COP and be able to apply it without having to go hunt for formulas. So, you know, different levels of challenge and um, not necessarily every problem is going to be exactly six minutes. They just need to average six minutes when you look back at the entirety of the section. So hope that helps. Any questions or comments, please drop me an email. Give me a call. I answer every message. I'll see you in the next video.